it's okay for humor to just, you know, kind of get everybody, you know, relaxed a little bit. But um, I was driving here and I saw a sign that said, watch for children. And I thought, that sounds like a fairly reasonable trait. Aha, uh -huh, okay, yeah, just think about it, just think about it. <laughs> At work, at work, I, I, I have to like lead these rounds with a lot of serious people and they're always grumpy and nobody wants to be there and we're talking about sick people and it's just a bad, you know, environment. So I always try to tell a joke at the end of it because everybody's kind of just like ho-hum. And uh, I always tell a joke like that and then they're all just like, what? And then five minutes later or maybe an hour or two later, they'll come back and be like, I get it. <laughs> But yeah, um, and then furthermore, uh, I was debating about what the Lord would have me speak about today, <clears throat> and I had something in my mind for a long time since Pastor asked me that I was going to speak about, and then as uh, the election was getting closer and everything was kind of going crazy, I'm like, maybe I should be talking about something that's like, you know, related to current events, and then I thought, no, you know what, actually what I had been thinking about um, I think is much more relevant to our, the current events than, um, than, than we would like to admit. So let's go ahead and open our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. And this, this passage has been, uh, for me... Um, it's like my go-to. Uh, anytime I don't really know what to read or what to study or, uh, you know, I'm kind of in between devotional plans or I'm in between, or because I don't read through the Bible every year. So I read through it one year and then the next year I might study a book or, a, or two books or whatever. But so if I'm in between trying to figure out what I'm going to study, I look at Second Peter chapter 1 and there's a reason for that. Every time I'm asked to write a philosophy of something, a philosophy of nursing, a philosophy of music, what have you. I always go to Second Peter chapter 1. Um, so let's just read it, and then I think you'll see why. But it says, Second Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and, and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's all one sentence. That's a lot in one sentence, but let's keep going. Verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the king, everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I was thinking about uh, the current time that in which we live, and in relation to this passage, this this passage is really talking about two things. One, our salvation, and two, how to pursue righteousness, how to live a life that's pleasing to God. Um, and no matter what time we're living in, whether we have a good president, whether we have a bad president, whether we have a dictator, whether we have an emperor, whether we have a king, whatsoever we have, this truth about how we can live a life that's pleasing to God is not going to change. It's going to be the same regardless of the climate we find ourselves surrounded by. Um, so with that in mind, let's dig into this a little bit. We're just going to kind of go verse by verse. Uh, hopefully we can get to the end. I don't have a whole lot to say about everything. Um, the first four verses can really be reduced to one concept. It's our salvation, 
and it's based upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the grace of God. God has bestowed salvation on us because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and therefore our position is secured. That's the, the first four verses can be boiled down to that concept. He begins the book by introducing himself first. He says Peter, and then he says who he is. He's a, an apostle, he's a servant. And he's also establishing that the Gentiles to whom he's writing have obtained the same faith that had been held by the Jews. So, he, so he's saying, you guys have the same faith that I have as an apostle. Uh, I'm, I'm Peter the apostle, I, I'm a Jew, and you Gentiles have the same exact faith that I have. And that is the faith only obtained because of the righteousness of Jesus, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, is what it says. The emphasis is on Christ's work and God's gracious bestowing of a righteous standing on the believer. And it's of note that in the Greek, which I can't read Greek, but I was reading some people that can read Greek, they were saying that the phrase, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, it actually is one article. So you could read it this way have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a, and this verse can be used to support the deity of Christ in Scripture because it's talking about God and Jesus as the same person, um, which I thought was interesting, and I like to read it that way. We have obtained like, who have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God, who is also and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's Peter introducing himself as the apostle, the servant. Um, he's talking to Christians that have the identical faith, and they have that through Christ's righteousness. So he goes on to say, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. And what this is saying is grace and peace can be multiplied because we have been given everything pertaining to salvation through a saving knowledge of God. It's just like when the angels announced Jesus coming to the world, they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And Brother Schwenke actually preached on that whenever he was here, and I thought that was a really compelling message. I don't know if you guys remember it or not, but he was saying that God is saying, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men, because now there can be peace and goodwill toward men because Jesus had just come into the world at that time. So our substitution was in the process of being paid. So now we can have peace and goodwill towards men from God. And so it's another way of saying that our position in Christ is secure. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you, he says. Um, and that's because we have been given everything we need through the knowledge of God. So the emphasis here is on our established position in Christ. We have been given all of the promises of salvation through which we have escaped the corrupt world, is what it says. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God, as he hath given all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Exceeding great and precious promises, we're partakers of the divine nature, and we've escaped the corruption of the world. Now, I also look at this verse, and, and I think all, all three of those verses, 2, 3, and 4, he's really saying the, the same thing, that we have, he, he was telling the, these Gentiles that he's writing to that they have obtained the same faith that he has that you're saved, you're, you're secure. Uh, through the work of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, his completely righteous and perfect life that he lived, the perfect substitution as the second Adam to God for us, our position is secure. So secure that we have actually part, are, have already partaken in the divine nature because we have the Holy Spirit. So, And we have all these promises in the Old Testament, and now he's writing in the New Testament, of salvation of this new nature that we have, of the, the promise of salvation that we have. Um, he's establishing all of that because he's going to tell them in the next couple of verses what that should mean to them. He's, he's saying, you have this salvation, you are saved, you are secure, and now we're going to move on to what that should mean for you. Um, I, I used to think of these verses as, you know, God's given us everything that we need for life and godliness. And I think you can read it that way. Because as a saved person, I really do have everything that I need for life and godliness. And he's given me everything that I need in his word. And then whatever, whatever I don't have here, the Holy Spirit will teach me through here. Right? 
So I, I ha literally do have everything that I need for life and godliness, and that's exactly what it says. So I don't like whenever I am talking to somebody who's, who is a professing believer, and then and they essentially will say, well, we can agree to disagree on that because I don't think that, I think it's a quote-unquote gray area or what have you. And I, yes, it's like, okay, I understand what they're saying in one sense that there are some really difficult concepts that we can, we can try to work through. But what this verse is telling me is that we have everything that we need for life and godliness. And if that's true, then we can be sure that the life that we're living is pleasing to the Lord, which kind of takes away any gray areas that there might be. Uh, but that doesn't take away our responsibility to figure out what that means. And that's what we're, we're going to get into today a little bit. Um, so that's really how he's setting up the list that he gives us. He's setting it up by establishing first that we are saved and, we're, and we have this, all of these precious promises and we have everything that we need for life and godliness. And really, you don't have to worry about your position. Here's the key point. You don't have to do anything to be saved. You don't have to prove anything to God that you're worthy of salvation. You're already there. You, you, you have that. God's given that to you because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You have it. So then he says, based upon all that, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So, first of all, the reason I believe that Peter focuses first on establishing that position is because he's going to talk about how to live a fruitful Christian life. But he doesn't want our attention to be placed on the works of righteousness which we have done. Uh, rather, he describes a response to the indescribable privilege of being born again. So we have been given all these things, and now what is our response to that? Um, and that we define as fruit, and you can tell a tree by its fruit, right? So in a sense, that's our way of gauging whether a person is a Christian or not, but the fruit doesn't make you a Christian. So we have to make that distinction because it's a little bit tricky. And if the, the world, from the world's perspective, this list is things that I must do in order to become a Christian. And that's not, that's not what Peter's saying. Based upon the entire first four verses that he precedes the list with, it's pretty clear that he's establishing that we are already Christians. And then because of this, now we're going to give all diligence to add to our faith. But this is where it gets difficult for us because God has chosen not to completely sanctify us right whenever we're saved. So we have this process of sanctification that happens. And sanctification just means the setting apart of something. So as soon as you made that profession of faith, and you gave your life to Christ, and you admitted that you were wrong, that you are a sinner, and you repented, which means you turned to God so that you can then go in this direction towards God, all of that lifestyle that you formerly were living doesn't just automatically go away. Now our mindset changes, and now there's a battle. Right at that point, there's a battle because now we want to be going this way, but our flesh wants to continue that way, right? So it's not just an easy okay, I made the decision to become a Christian, now life's hunky-dory, I'm going to go this way, no problems. That's not how it works. That's not how God designed it. It's a, it's a process. And what Peter's going to give us here is, okay, now that you're going this way, this is what the natural response is to a life as a Christian. This is what it's going to look like. This is what we should see. This is what we want to see. And then he also tells us that if you are going this way, so you're a Christian, but you're not adding these things, then he'll tell us what that looks like also. So he gives us both. Um, and I think it's interesting that he says, giving all diligence. So this is something that we have to do. Add to your faith. Um, we believe in progressive sanctification, but I don't believe that it's a passive thing. I don't believe it's a passive process. I think it's an active process. And I think it's an active process that we have to participate in. It's in, done in conjunction with the Holy Spirit who, who convicts our hearts. And then, but then we also have to participate in this progression towards a more righteous life. And that's why I've entitled this message The Christian Pursuit of Righteousness because I think it is the Christian thing to do. 
If, if you're a Christian, you're going to want to, and you should, pursue righteousness. And it's not something you can do on your own. And whenever the world tries to do this, it becomes a list of things we have to do in order to become saved. Right? But as a Christian person, these are totally things that we can do, and God's empowered us to do them. And he's actually telling us that with all diligence, we should be adding these things to our faith. So he says, the Christian pursuit of righteousness here is in response of God's gift to salvation. We know that. And it's because of what's our sole purpose here on life right now as Christians, our sole purpose. It's to live a life that is pleasing to God, that's obedient to God. And that our obedience to God is going to, to produce a lot of things in our life. Evangelism, uh, all of the fruits of the Spirit, which we know, and a lot of the things in this list, too. And that can all be boiled down to our obedience to the Lord. That's what John 15 is all about whenever Jesus is saying, Abide in me, keep my commandments. It's all about being obedient to the Lord. That's what characterizes a child of God. So in order to live a life that is pleasing to God, we have to live a life that's obedient to God. So I like this little statement. Um, it's, it goes like this. It is, it is possible to be disciplined without being spiritual, but it is impossible to be spiritual without being disciplined. So I'll read that again. It is possible to be disciplined without being spiritual, but it's impossible to be spiritual without being disciplined. And that just makes sense, right? Because if we're discipline is really denying yourself. Self-discipline is denying yourself. And if I'm not going to be living a life that is denying my fleshly desires in any area, then really, are you in control of your life? There was a Navy SEAL who talked about this all the time. He said, well, people think that freedom actually means being able to do whatever you want. And that's not really true, because if you're doing whatever you want, then your wants are controlling you. So he said, really, true freedom is being able to decide what you're going to do regardless of what you want. That's true freedom, and that's really what you can boil discipline down to. And I think that's, that statement um, comes from John MacArthur, but I, I could be wrong about that. Uh, but I, I've always remembered it. I've written it down a bunch of times because I think it's a really good uh, thing to remember. So we must give all diligence. It is our desire to be righteous once we're children of God, and Peter is going to tell us how to do this. So he said, he gives us this list, verses 5 through 7. Faith is first, and then we're going to add virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. So let's just look at them each. Um, virtue, I like how uh, one of the commentators said it. It's the God-given ability to perform heroic deeds. Now imagine if every Christian added to their faith this idea that they have this God-given ability to perform heroic deeds. Just the first, the first one that he lists there. I mean, how many of you got up today and said, let's see what kind of heroic deeds I can perform today, you know? And that's a... That's a very ambitious thing, but we have the power of God inside of us. I mean, we shouldn't really be limiting ourselves, right? I mean, if God wants us to do something, no matter how far-fetched it may seem to us in our humanness, we should be able to say, yeah, okay, let's, let's do it. You know, God's the one driving the boat, so if he wants to take the boat in that direction, uh, I'll go, <laughs> right? Um, so, I mean, that's virtue. It's a frame of mind. I like to think of this as a frame of mind that I have that's preparing myself for whatever trials may lay ahead. So you're adding to your faith virtue, because I know that I'm saved, I know I'm a Christian, we've established that through the first four verses, and now that I'm a Christian and I have this faith, I'm going to add to it this idea, this frame of mind that I need to be prepared for whatever's going to come against me, because we do not fight against flesh and blood, we fight against principalities and powers and the ruler of the darkness of this age, which we can see very clearly today, just by turning on the news. I mean, you can see it everywhere. I mean, even in our workplaces, everywhere, we see... Uh, the prince of the power of the air, um, which is another way of saying the one who's in charge of this world system, which is Satan. We see him working through everything, deception, deceit, uh, half-truths, even like 98% truths that have 2% lie in them, a lot of things like that, which are really uh, hard to slice through sometimes. But in this world in which we live, in which we're fighting things like that, uh, we need to have a mind that is virtuous, or in this sense, it's ready to do the hard things or to endure the hard things. We just have to have that mindset. Or you can get up in the morning and say, I'm going to do something heroic because I have the Holy Spirit and I can. You know, 
Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Jonathan and his armor bearer slew 20 Philistines after they climbed up a mountain. You know, you hear of all the people in the Old Testament, the, the guy who defended the bean patch with his spear, and he killed 500, 500 enemy soldiers that way. You know, we read about these people. The guy who killed two lion-like men. The guy who took the spear from the giant Egyptian in the pit and killed him with his own spear. All of these things. And we look at those and we're like, wow, that's rather violent, right? But God was using Israel in that time for a specific purpose. We're not going to get into all of that. But you get my point. People have done heroic things back then, and we don't have to be limited because we're not living in the Old Testament. I mean, you could think of all the things that Paul went through. He was shipwrecked. He got bit by a snake. He was whipped how many times? How many things did he go through? He established how many churches in the New Testament and in Europe and Asia, everywhere? And uh, that's not that far away from us. It's like 2,000 years, you know? I mean, we don't have to be limited. That's what I'm saying. So we could have a little bit more ambition, I think, as Christians than, than we do. We like to get into our little routine, and then um, we don't get out of that routine because it's a little uncomfortable. But at the same time, we need to have this virtuous mindset where, all right, you know, if the Lord wants to take me out of my comfort zone, I'm ready to go. You know, I'm ready. So it's not just a blind, ready-to-go, headlong into whatever, though. It's equipped with something else, knowledge. And knowledge is the truth properly comprehended and applied. I like that way of saying it. Truth, properly comprehended and applied. I like that way of saying it because that implies that there is a right way to comprehend truth, which means there is an objective truth that is discoverable and it's not something that comes from me. It's something that's outside of myself, which is an important distinction to make because in today's day and age, many people think that truth is whatever I think it is. So if I think my truth is this and you think your truth is this, then there's no way for us to meet at all. But if there is an objective truth that's outside of everybody that can be properly comprehended and then properly applied, then we should all be able to agree because it's there. It's, we can discover it. So having knowledge, properly comprehended and applied truth, how do we get that? I mean, the Greek word in this case is, it's what the word we get, science. It's knowledge. It's, it's information. Um, but I think it's a little bit more than that. It's actually knowledge of God. It's, uh, it's knowing what is true. And, I mean, as a Christian person, I've seen this throughout my entire schooling career, which is far too long. But um, every, everywhere that I've gone, you, can, you see every subject you're being taught, whether it's English, history, any sci- of the sciences, biology, geology, whatever. Um, we have a better way of looking at the world because of what we know to be true of the world, because of the Bible. And as Ken Ham likes to say, if we look at the world through our spiritual glasses or our biblical glasses, it's gonna, we're going to see things a certain way. And that's true. I mean, the Proverbs say, or it's actually in Psalms, that you've made me wiser than my teachers for that reason. Because even though you might know everything there is to know about you know, medicine or you know, cardiology or whatever, but you don't understand the truth of the Bible and how those two things connect, you really understand nothing when it comes to what's actually meaningful. Practically and in, in the physical side of things, you know, cardiology is a really big field and it's meaningful, but in the grand scheme of things, for eternity, you know, just because a cardiologist passes cardiology boards does not mean anything in terms of his eternal security. So we just need to make sure that those priorities are in order. So we start with faith, our position is secure, We add to that the mindset that we're going to endure trials, and then we add to that knowledge of truth, capital T, truth. And then what's next? Uh, Temperance or self-control. It's self-restraint, it's self-discipline. We kind of talked about this one already. The ability to control myself. Um, That's really all we need to say about that. Patience is next, perseverance. It's endurance but not with resignation, like, okay, I have to endure this, it, but it's endurance with hope. So I'm going to endure this because I know what's coming up. I know what the Lord has in store for me after. So I'm going to endure this. And when I was studying about this, I thought of uh, Louis Zamperini, who was, a, uh, he was a, an Olympic athlete in the 30s. And then whenever World War II happened, he joined the military. I think he was a pilot. And then his plane went down and he became a prisoner of war in Japan. And they made a movie about him called Unbroken. Um, and he became a Christian uh, 
I think it was after that all happened, but uh, his, the reason he was famous is because he went through, I mean, if you know half of the things that that man went through, I mean, they were really atrocious things, but his spirit and his resolve never broke the entire time that he was there. Even though he, he didn't have enough food, he was beaten, he had all kinds of things done to him. He was attacked by a shark in the middle of the ocean. I mean, all of these absolutely stunning things, his spirit didn't break. And that's what the perseverance that it's talking about here is. It's that, that frame of mind that we're, we have a hope. We're pressing towards the mark, right? We're forgetting those things which are behind and we're moving this way. And we're not going to break no matter what. That's perseverance. It's patience. Um, and then we go to brotherly love, which is us as a community of believers, this is how we're supposed to be interacting with each other. It's a love of the brethren. It's a love of getting together with people that are Christians, that are of a like mind, that have the like precious faith with us, that are going to inherit glory with us and with Christ. And we need to value that coming together and being together and being a family in Christ. And we need to uh, sacrifice for each other. And that's what being a family and being brothers and sisters in Christ is all about. It's, it's sacrificing for each other. Um, and that's one of the, the three stools of a church, right? I mean, the three legs of the stool. The one is we come together to glorify God. And the second one is we come together to edify the fellow believers. And then the third one is evangelize the lost. That's what our, that's what our calling is, those three things. That's the, our purpose here. Glorify God, we're gonna edify one another. That's the love of the brethren, Philadelphia. And the third is uh, to evangelize the lost. And then lastly is love. This is, this is actually self-sacrifice, but it's not necessarily a mutual self-sacrifice like the brotherly kindness. This is a self-sacrifice without getting anything in return necessarily. You are sacrificing for this person out of Christian charity uh, or Christian love. And I think charity is a really good word in the translation there because what does charity mean to us? It's sacrificial giving without uh, the hope of getting anything back in return. It's charity. You're giving it out, with, and you're not expecting to get anything back. And that is exactly what love is. That's how our lives as Christians are supposed to be characterized, by giving without expecting anything back in return. It's sacrificial giving. So then he says that if we have these things, we will be fruitful, or rather, we'll be pleasing to God. But if we do not have these things, then we have, and this is key, we have forgotten that we were purged from our old sins. He says he has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Um, and if that's the case, we're going to be living a life that's more in, in tune with the old man. We're going to be living a life of doubt because we're not going to be producing fruit. So if you know the tree by its fruit and you don't have any fruit, then how do you know that you are that tree, right? You, you could be, and that's what this is saying. You know, I mean, you could, you could be a Christian person. You could have the verse, first four verses of this chapter apply to you. And you could not be adding these things to your life. And then you will be blind. And you won't be able to see you far off. You're going to forget that you were purged from your old sins. Those are all the consequences of that. You're going to fall into that rut of living your life as a physical human being in this world. And this is all that there is. And there's nothing after. And that's the danger for us. Um, so, I mean, really, I think that this is a really relevant passage of Scripture for us today because, like I said, regardless of the political climate we see ourselves in, we as Christians need to be ready to do heroic deeds empowered by the Holy Spirit, no matter what the climate is around us, whether it's comfortable to do so or whether it's not comfortable to do so because we not only have virtue, the ability to do these amazing things, but we have the next thing, which is knowledge so we know what we're getting into we have temperance we can control ourselves and we can make these hard decisions even though we, we might not want to we have the ability to endure them whenever they come and godliness is the result of that righteousness i mean that's what we're pursuing right godliness we're pursuing a life of righteousness that's going to be pleasing to god um these things the list here isn't given in like a stepwise fashion. Like it's not something like first you got to get virtue and then you got to get knowledge and then you got to get temperance and then patience and then godliness and so on and so forth. That's not how it's supposed to work. It's uh, all of these things are happening together. It's like the facets of a, of a diamond really. It's all, they're all happening together. 
Um, so the end result is godliness, is righteousness, which I know is part of the list, which is why it's a little bit confusing because you think you have to add that to your life, and we do because that's what we're pursuing, but godliness is the end result. So we start with faith, we add virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity, and if these things be in you and abound, they make it so that you will not be unfruitful. You will be fruitful. But if you don't do these things, you're going to be blind, you're not going to be able to see afar off, you're going to forget that you were purged from your old sins, and you're going to fall right back into that rut of not being able to do heroic deeds for the Lord, um, which is really what we as Christians should be doing. Imagine if just the people in this room it's a lot of people had that virtuous mindset of doing heroic deeds. Um, I mean, just imagine what we could do, what we could do in the world. So uh, let's, uh, let's all be reminded of that today, um, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time we were able to look at your word. Thank you for Peter's epistle and for the things that we can learn of it. Thank you for the, the conviction that it brings into my life and uh, all of the things that he shows me that I'm lacking, but I thank you that he shows me why I might be doubting or blind or not being able to see far off or have confidence or um, feel like I'm, I'm just struggling. I thank you that he allows me to diagnose that. And I, I pray, Father, that you would work this into our lives and that we would, with all diligence, work to add these to our faith. I thank you for faith. I thank you for the fact that we're secure um, eternally in you and we are in your hand, and there's nothing that can take us out of it. I just thank you for that comfort. I thank you that you love us. I thank you for your grace and for your mercy. I pray that you would give us all safe travels home tonight. I pray for Pastor and uh, his family as they're away. I pray that you'd give them a good uh, vacation, a good time away, and that you'd bring them back to us safely. And just be with us through the remainder of the week. Be with the services on Sunday and with the teens uh, and the children downstairs, that you would do a mighty work of salvation in their lives. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.